Good afternoon and welcome to Harvard Divinity School. I'm Diane Moore. I am the director of the Religious Literacy Project and a lecturer here in Religion, Conflict, and Peace. And it is our incredible privilege to welcome you all here and to host this remarkable panel uh, of experts on this really rich intersection of religion and law enforcement generally, but particularly related to the FBI. I just want to thank Steve Herrick, who has been behind the scenes to organize this, has done a remarkable job, as all things he does, in relationship to the AAR. I also have to say, and I think this might be my only occasion to be able to do this, where he's actually in the room, this will be Steve's last um, uh, annual meeting, because he is retiring. And our, our big joke is that when he retires, my life is going to be a lot lighter because we do so many important projects together and have been, I've been inspired by Steve for several years and I am uh, incredibly grateful for the privilege of having the opportunity to collaborate with him on several different uh, projects, this being just the last among them. So if we could just give Steve Herrick a round of applause for his remarkable work. It's also Jack Fitzmyers last year, but we're going to honor him appropriately uh, with a formal gathering at the AAR. But Jack, I'm so happy to have you here, and thank you also for your remarkable service. Oh, thank you. And I am uh, going to just turn the podium over to Philip Hyman, who is going to be the moderator for this panel, and Phil, uh, and he is a. Uh, uh, Professor Emeritus at the law school and very much involved in these questions. And again, it's our great privilege to host you here and to thank you for being with us. And I'll turn it over to you now. So thank, thank you. you. <clears throat> uh, I thought the best thing I could do for this panel is to give a short history of, of Waco, just what happened at Waco, and then turn it over to the panel. I'll go to Steve Weitzman first. Um, the Bureau was already, uh, let me tell you what the lessons are when we're all through. At the time of Waco, we're going to find a, a stark separation between negotiators, hostage rescue team, and social scientists, including religious scholars. Each was going its own way. There was no adequate organization, number two, for coordinating them. All of these things have been, uh, as far as I can tell, pretty well overcome. Uh, number three, uh, we, we had, I, would, I want to make clear that I had no <coughs> role in setting it up. I was, my role was to investigate it afterwards and see what went wrong. Uh, the hostage rescue team is trained for terrorist type activities, maybe not wholly and maybe not now, but at that time, that's what it was. I was invited as Deputy Attorney General down to Quantico to watch a, rescue, a, a mock rescue. And they had a little house there and you could see through the roof. There was no roof there. And inside were uh, people pretending not that were uh, cardboard mock-ups of people who were said to be the hostages. We were to pretend we were the hostages. and. Uh, inside uh, were, uh, F I'm sorry, these were to be uh, r rather the, uh, the bad guys, rather the terrorists. And FBI agents, live ones, were sitting very near them uh, and pretending to be the hostages. Uh, there was a noise. You could watch this all from a tower at Quantico. Uh, we were up at the, in the tower, the, the honored guests were. All of a sudden you hear uh, a beep. Helicopters came almost instantly overhead. They dropped down, uh, left stun grenades at the door of the mock-up of a building where hostages were held, poured in. You heard machine guns going, ah, and all the, all the plastic or cardboard mock-ups of supposed terrorists were cut in half. 
And the FBI agents, I'm, I'm probably exaggerating somewhere along here, I'm not trying to. The FBI agents who had been asked to sit there as if they were the hostages were fine. They weren't touched. It was a very acrobatic, highly skilled operation that took a matter of seconds. And it was remarkable. Now we shift to along comes Waco. There are 50 days. The hostage rescue team is more or less in charge. Uh, they are getting very frustrated. They're used to ending an operation within about three and a half seconds. Not, li not literally, but within a very short period of time, probably measurable in seconds. They've been there for 50 days, literally 50 days. Uh, and there's no movement at all. And they have no, and instead of there being terrorists uh, who they're supposed to uh, disarm or kill, there are 100 people in the Branch Davidian compound, men, women, and children. And instead of those people wanting to escape if an armed government force can only give them a way out, those people largely want to be there. OK, it's, so it's totally novel. The hostage rescue team is the, absolutely, at that time, the wrong group of people to be negotiating. They don't have much negotiating experience. They don't understand the Branch Davidians, who are pretty hard to understand. Uh, we have no, we, we, there, were, there were religious leaders brought in to help, but they were brought in sort of offhand. And uh, the hostage rescue team put together a plan to knock down the walls of the Branch Davidian compound and let everybody out who wanted to get out. Okay, let me now take it in. Uh, what I want you to do is get a feel for how, uh, un, how there was no qualified focus on information, wisdom, knowledge of the Branch Davidians, knowledge of how highly religious people would react to the storming of their compound. There was none of that. OK. The Bureau was already uh, well along at the time of Waco in creating it, the capabilities it needed for, getting, for saving the lives of hostages who wanted to leave but were being held by terrorists. Um, the, uh, I arrived on the day that they stormed the Waco compound of the Branch Davidians. Uh, we, I learned within the next couple of days that uh, it, broke, it broke into flames almost immediately and some 70 people, 60 or 70 people were killed in the flames, all, all members of the Branch Davidians or children associated with them. Um, the fire, we knew, had been set, gasoline had been strewn throughout the compound by senior members of the Branch Davidians. We knew that because what hostage rescue team was already very good at was surveillance and with surveillance devices, they were able to hear conversations about spreading the gasoline. Now, there was no question left about that. The Bureau had taken over the assignment of making arrests among the Branch Davidians from the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. They, the, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms had gone in uh, trying to arrest uh, the leaders of the Branch Davidians for holding, uh, for having unlicensed and unpermitted weapons in large numbers. When the alcohol, tobacco, and firearms went, tried to go in, they were shot from the inside and three agents were killed. Uh, that immediately changed the flavor com completely. I, I want you, I want to give you a sense of just how 
difficult this situation was, how unprepared we really were for it. When agents get killed, other agents get upset. And uh, there was, it was going to be very hard to unwind it without somehow they're making arrests of the people who had killed the alcohol, tobacco, and firearm agents. Um, there were about 100 people inside. They were highly armed. But the hostages, I've, as I've said, didn't want to meet, leave. That didn't, they weren't there for that purpose. Over the course of about 50 days, there was an on and off debate among the hostage rescue team, the FBI negotiators, and a few social scientists brought in by the FBI as to what should be done. 50 days is a, a long time. Everybody was outdoors. At the beginning, David Koresh, the leader of the Branch Davidians, allowed a number of people to leave if they chose to leave the compound. Negotiations for, for the very gradual release of the rest of them looked promising, at least to the negotiators. Um, but then the leaders of the Branch Davidian, as far as uh, the FBI could tell, began to stall and negotiations looked less promising. At that, again, uh, the lack of understanding between the com combatants here, the combatant groups, is absolutely stunning. At that point, the decision was made to put pressure on the occupants of the, of the compound by playing loud music, including this uh, loud noise, including the, so the sound of dying rabbits. The rabbits were killed and screamed as they were killed, and that was broadcast. Uh, we shut off, I, again, I, I was just going to arrive about, uh, I don't know, five hours later. Shut off the power and the nights were becoming colder, so it was a tough place to be. Put up spotlights to shine on the Davidian compound and started moving the perimeter around the compound, you know, maybe it was 50 yards out in all directions, started moving it in. So it became 40 yards and 30 yards. If, if you want to confuse people and be confused by their response, everything was being done, in a sense, wrong. Uh, this seemed to anger, only to anger the, the Davidians, and uh, slow negotiations came to a stop. Uh, the uh, FBI had arranged for, or the Justice Department had arranged for military tanks to be there. Uh, the, the tanks went up to this sort of frame, weak frame uh, compound, knocked down the walls. As soon as the walls were knocked down, uh, the people inside, the leaders inside, poured gasoline over the floors and lit the match. And in no time, there was nothing to be done from then on. OK. Um, so as our uh, guests talk, picture the fact that we had no coordination among units we had no knowledge of the opposition, no adequate knowledge of the opposition among the people who were running the operation. Uh, we, the situation got out of control with anger after uh, the Branch Davidians got angry at our broadcasting, our, I'm talking about government broadcasting noises and making it impossible to sleep. Uh, the, uh, something was desperately wrong, and 70 people died. In the meantime, I should say, within very quickly, I was asked to write a report by the Attorney General. I was Deputy Attorney General. Uh, I used the best people we had in the Justice Department. They did a very good job of writing a report. We brought in 10 experts from around the world. They gave advice on what we'd done wrong and what would have to be done differently. The, uh, in, in the ensuing years, 
the FBI reacted with remarkable uh, ab ability to learn from experience. Nobody likes learning much from experience. Soon after, there was a, three years later, there was a uh, hostage barricade in the West. I can tell you where it was. Uh, Montana. In Montana. Mm -hmm. uh, Louis Free, the head of the FBI, uh, made sure that things were taken slowly, that uh, people who wanted to barricade themselves in Montana could barricade themselves in Montana for as long as they wanted. Uh, they were in there for... 83 days. 82 days. Thank you. Um, then there was another hostage situation with willing host with people who were willingly part of a blockaded uh, building in uh, Oregon, and they occupied it for five weeks. Again, uh, there was no rush, there was no tanks, there was no dying rabbits, there were no bright lights, and everything again resulted in a, a peaceful solution. The peaceful solution is now embodied in uh, the unit of the FBI responsible for blockade uh, events, hostage taking events, but that I'm sure we're about to hear about. And with that, I'm going to turn to your first speaker, um, the uh, if I can, all right, I know, our first speaker, uh, Stephen Weitzman, professor of Hebrew and Semitic languages and literature at the University of Pennsylvania. Thank you. Thank you. And then I think I'll speak from from my seat. Can you all hear me? Great. Um, so I want to begin by thanking Steve and the others who've organized this panel, um, especially allowing, for allowing into the discussion an outsider such as myself, um, who cannot speak with the kind of authority that um, the others here can. Everyone else you will be hearing from this afternoon will be drawing on firsthand experience, either as people who uh, work or have worked for the FBI or as scholars who have engaged the FBI over the years. Um, I cannot claim any of that experience. I do not benefit from it, and I must acknowledge, therefore, that my perspective is very limited. Um, the reason I'm here, I think, is because I published a study of the AR's interaction with the FBI over uh, de decades. And for me, initially, the reason I was interested in that was it was a chance to learn something about the academic study of religion and its efforts to make a positive difference in the world. Even a very practical and scientific field like medicine is beset by a great gap between research and application. Medical researchers lament the fact that it takes on average 17 years for a new discovery to be incorporated into clinical practice. The challenges are even greater when one is talking about a humanities-driven field like religious studies, and those challenges were what I originally wanted to understand by studying the AAR's interaction with the FBI, which is what we're here to, today to discuss. Um, as I got into that research, however, I began to appreciate that what we are here to talk about today is just one chapter of a much larger story, and in fact an important story for understanding the history of religion and religious liberty in America. The conflict at Waco was actually not the first time that the FBI found itself in conflict with a religious community that it perceived to be threatening or criminal. Already during World War I, what was then known as the Bureau of Investigation was charged with enforcing laws that led it to treat religious groups like the American Friends Service Committee and the Church of God in Christ, which is a predominantly African-American denomination of, of Pentecostal Christianity, as suspect or subversive. And, the, and these were simply the earliest of a range of religious groups treated in such a way as a, as a result of the Bureau's obligation to uphold the law, including black Muslim groups like the Moorish Science Temple of America, which was sus suspected of subversive activities in the 1940s, Shinto priests, who fell under suspicion during the same period, Catholic anti-war activists during the Vietnam War, and a number of other groups. Whether or not its suspicions were justified in each and every case, the FBI has been a major player and sometimes a major disruptor of religious life in 20th century America, intervening in various kinds of religious communities. 
And in fact, I, I, I've come to realize changing the course of religious history in America. The era of the Cold War is probably the best example of this impact, not only because of the FBI's treatment of various dissident religious groups in this period, but also because J. Edgar Hoover intervened in religious life in other ways as well, aligning the FBI with certain religious perspectives against others, and even developing religious ideas of his own through his publications. For Hoover, America's conflict with Russia was a war between Judeo-Christian values and a godless communism that was bent on destroying religion, um, a communism that also sought to infiltrate and manipulate religion in order to pursue its nefarious ends. Hoover's efforts to combat communism mirrored, uh, or actually used some manipulative tactic tactics of his own. For him, religious leaders fighting for civil rights or opposing the Vietnam War, whether they were Protestants, Catholics, or Jews, were puppets of the enemy. And under his leadership, the FBI's efforts to combat them included surveillance, excuse me, included surveillance, infiltration, the arrest of certain religious leaders, campaigns to discredit certain groups, the sowing of discord within certain groups. We, we are arranging for your car to be towed right now. <laughs> <laughs> it's really hard to actually, uh, uh, we had lunch before and the people from the FBI are just seemed like wonderful people and that makes this presentation a little more difficult. Um, uh, and I'm not gonna mention J. Edgar Hoover's uh, efforts to pressure MLK, which included um, blackmailing him, attempts to blackmail him, and even encouraging MLK to kill himself. So the most egregious practices came to an end after the death of Hoover and in the wake of congressional investigations that occurred in the 1970s. But the Waco siege brought to the surface other issues in the way the FBI interacted with especially non-mainstream religious groups. And also I should note more recently, civil liberty organizations have raised certain concerns about the FBI's surveillance of Muslim Americans in particular. I just want to offer one example uh, to suggest that some of the issues that uh, surfaced during the Cold War haven't quite gone away. Before I moved to Penn, I taught at Stanford where I had a, a wonderful student named Shariah Mayfield. I can talk about the following experience that she had because she has published about it herself. Shariah is the daughter of a lawyer, is the daughter of a lawyer in Oregon named Brandon Mayfield, who in 2004 was arrested by the FBI in connection with a train bombing in Madrid that left 194 people dead. Her father, Brandon, whose passport was expired at the time, was identified as a suspect because his fingerprints supposedly matched those on a bag containing detonating material that was found at the site of the bombing. Drawing on powers given to them by the Patriot Act, the FBI placed Mayfield and his family under surveillance for an extended period and then placed Mayfield himself under arrest when it became evident that its investigation was about to go public, um, insisting that his fingerprint was a hung fingerprints were a 100% match with the ones found in Madrid. As it turns out, however, the fingerprint identification was mistaken and the FBI's treatment of Mayfield was considered sufficiently wrongful that the government agreed to a $2 million settlement that included a very rare formal apology as a part of the settlement. Now, what makes this case relevant to our present discussion is Mayfield's status as a convert to Islam. An investigation of what went wrong by the Inspector General found that his really religious affiliation had no role in the mistaken fingerprint match. The people doing the analysis had no knowledge of his religious identity at the time they made the match. But, this, the Inspector General also found that anti-Muslim bias may have contributed to the FBI's unwillingness to re-examine the case after it was challenged by Spanish law enforcement. Hearing this story from Mayfield's daughter, Sharia, who was a wonderful student, and the fear that it imposed on the family, the turmoil that it caused for them, and her own abiding suspicion of the government that I think persists to this day, hearing all that brought home to me that religious bias continues to play some role in FBI culture into the post 9-11 era, and that there are real costs for innocent people. So I was surprised to learn, after I was starting to learn about these experiences, that there was no book that documented the history of the FBI's interaction with religious communities. There were books about Waco, there was a book about the FBI and the Catholic Church, and a few other studies of specific episodes or people, but the larger picture remained unclear. And that is how my colleague Sylvester Johnson and I, along with a dozen other scholars, some of whom are here today, were moved to produce a book entitled The FBI and Religion that was, a, that was meant as a step toward filling in this gap. 
Once I began to appreciate that larger history, I gained a deeper appreciation of what, the, what makes the effort that we are here to discuss today, that is what makes the AAR's effort to uh, collaborate with the FBI so significant and remarkable. That collaboration was, and hopefully is, an effort to change an organizational culture that has been more than a century in the making. And it's an effort to avoid tragedies like the one that happened at Waco, but also at stake in it is religious liberty in the United States and the future of religiously motivated dissent in our society. Now, given my status as an outsider to the AAR's efforts to work together with the FBI, probably the most helpful thing I can do to abet this kind of reflection is to raise some questions. So I want to use the next just few minutes that I have left to put three questions on the table. And I have probably two minutes left. So uh, I'll, I'll, I'll articulate them very quickly. So my first question is to the scholars um, who are part of this uh, collaboration. And my question is basically, what happened after 9-11? Because following the publications that a number of the scholars involved in this effort made, I can trace the story very clearly up until 9-11. Uh, the relationship between the FBI and the AR seemed to get stronger. There were incidents where one could see the benefits. But for me, as an outsider trying to trace the story, it gets a lot murkier after 9-11. So I would love to just hear the story of what happened after that event and how 9-11 and the aftermath of 9-11 kind of changed the picture. Uh, my second question is really um, to the members of the FBI here, which is, um, to ask what, how and in what way, um, from an institutional and an educational perspective, it's in a position to actually learn from its experience. Because as I've been trying to mention briefly, the story of the FBI's interaction with religion is a lot older than the Branch Davidian crisis, goes back to World War I at the very least, and there's a lot of history there, and I'm kind of wondering how that history gets uh, transmitted, if at all, to uh, FBI agents and analysts. Um, and my last question, uh, is really about uh, the role of race in everything. Because it became clear to us, uh, as we looked at the big century-long history, that some of the most egregious cases of mistreatment of religious communities happened to deal with African-American religious communities. Um, more Science Temple of America, the Nation of Islam, Martin Luther King. And um, it's clear to me that in Hoover's attitude towards Martin Luther King, for example, that religion is part of the story, race is part of the story, and there's some kind of intersection there uh, between race and religion that needs to be examined. Um, and I think this is even more important um, if it is true, as reported by the journal Foreign Policy, that the FBI has now assessed black identity extremists as a national security threat. I think race has to be part of the story. And I think that the way this group was set up in the 90s didn't necessarily allow for the intersection of race and religion to be part of what it was talking about. So I want to put that on the table as well, and thank you very much. Uh, Robin Montgomery, uh, presently chief of the Brookfield Police Department, uh, as an officer in the Marine Corps, received the Navy Cross for extreme gallantry and heroism in combat during the Vietnam War. He's been in the FBI, he had been in the FBI for 30 years, uh, including as the first special agent in charge of the critical incident uh, unit, which is the uh, child of Waco. Uh, Robin? I want to, uh, my first comment is that I've been retired for 20 years, so don't hold me accountable for what's happened since 1997, thank you. Um, but, uh, I was born in 1968, don't hold me accountable for anything. <laughs> right. um, what I'd like to do is give you kind of a thumbnail of how we got to the Critical Incident Response Group. I was the on-scene commander at Ruby Ridge, which is an incident that took place six months prior to Waco. And as a result of that uh, incident, I had written a less than favorable memorandum to the hierarchy about what I had observed. And I had observed, one, you don't send a dynamic entry uh, group into a stationary situation, which is what they did. They sent the hostage rescue team to basically a barricaded subject situation 
which cops deal with every day. <coughs> and uh, so that was one thing. Uh, the other thing was the uh, meddlesome questions by headquarters during the uh, uh, trying to resolve an issue was uh, overwhelming because you spent more time trying to tell somebody higher up the food chain what was going on and uh, it, it detracts from paying attention to what is actually happening on the ground. And there are some other things that I had mentioned. And um, interestingly enough, uh, uh, Mr. Hyman's report uh, actually brought those to the front because my memorandum never saw light of day. And uh, it was kind of a, a travesty in the FBI's time where uh, an agent actually got arrested um, for lying to the FBI about not sending this up the food chain, if you will. So some of the things that I had seen at this 10-day crisis occurred full blast uh, in Waco. Um, as a result of, of Waco, uh, Phil's report came out and the need to create a, a unit that was cohesive, that wasn't so stovepiped, needed to be done. And that's where the critical incident response group was created. And I actually had to fly back. I was the agent in charge in Portland, Oregon, fly back and interview with Janet Reno about this position. Um, and uh, she asked me, what could I do to help the situation? She was traumatized by what took place at Waco, as you can well imagine. Uh, she, 23 kids were killed in that process. Uh, and um, uh, so I think she did not have a real good uh, view of upper management's uh, guidance, if you will, given what took place. And um, I'm being very kind. I've, I've learned how to couch all these things and not four-letter jargon. So, uh, um, but I asked her to stop the uh, track meet to her office every time there was a crisis. Because what happens, you have, when you have multiple agencies involved, the heads of those agencies want to demonstrate how um, effective they are by running to the AG's office and letting her know what the current status was. Uh, and nine times out of 10, they had it all wrong. And so uh, she said, by all means, I, I understand what you're saying. And I will tell you, in once creating that group, um, she called me offline a number of times just to talk to me directly, which was you know not within protocol, which and I didn't bother telling anybody about it either. So uh, um, we developed something that is critical in not only uh, crisis management, but, but dealing with folks that we don't nearly deal with, and that's trust. And, and she had my trust, and I had her trust. Uh, and uh, so it made a very uh, good relationship in that regard, given some of the things that took place. I will tell you that. Um, Creating this group and creating some of the training mechanisms involved with it, um, I don't know where I had more pushback either internally or externally because uh, change in, uh, is, is tough for people to take, it, it appears. And um, um, I was like a pariah to my fellow uh, executives because they felt that I was really an informant for the director of the FBI. and. Uh, would, uh, if having to go out in a crisis situation, I would feed back uh, what, what ills they had and why they couldn't do things, and that was totally not the case. But we, we trained, uh, I, ma I mandated a training regimen between the hostage rescue team and the SWAT teams in the country, because what had happened with uh, Waco and with uh, Ruby Ridge is that the SWAT teams, which are made up of agents tactically trained within the uh, division in which the incident's occurring, uh, were getting left out of the uh, situation and, quite frankly, could have handled the situation equally as well, given what the circumstances were. So that was a change and, and then had a training program for executives on crisis management so that they understood what they were looking at when, when something did happen. 
And uh, another initiative was to have the agents in charge go out to the field and actually talk to people that may be involved in uh, you know, religious groups that may be offline, or, but just to be aware and, and to make a, uh, make a contact. Because quite frankly, one of the major rules in, in negotiation, hostage negotiation, is the negotiator wants to end up uh, having a personal relationship with the person that they're talking to. And so it's a lot harder to say no to somebody that you don't know uh, or that you know than somebody you don't know. So an effort was made to get uh, the agents out and talking to, uh, to people that uh, made them uncomfortable, if you will, religious groups. Um, um, and, you know, Greg Sathoff down at the end will attest that uh, um, it was a difficult job, but that's one of the things we saw is that we had to do to break, uh, break the chasm here. And so ultimately, um, Phil mentioned the Montana siege of 83 days. And here's the ironic thing. I had to testify on Capitol Hill a number of times regarding where the FBI was going with crisis management and it can't be another Waco. And um, when the Montana siege was finished, I was called back to testify and um, there was no, it had been no deaths, no, uh, uh, no crises, so to speak, and the issue at that time was that you spent too much money out there. So, I mean, that's what you deal with uh, in the Pentagon there, or the uh, Potomac River. Um, but we did everything opposite of what we did in Waco out in Montana. We had agents in blue jeans. We had uh, black and white police cars at roadblocks. We demilitarized the whole situation. Um, we brought in experts uh, to, to guide us and to actually talk to the subjects. Um, and, and it worked, it was an 83 day uh, junket, but it, uh, it was ended up peaceably and uh, I think set the benchmark for how, how the FBI was gonna do things in the future. And I will answer any questions you might have in the question and answer period, uh, since I can't be attributed to anything after 20 years, right? Okay, thank you. Uh, David Resch is special agent in charge of the FBI Academy. I think I heard him say an hour or two ago that you run about a thousand people, a thousand, Agents through it, agents and police chiefs, David? The, uh, Every year. Through our National Academy. Yeah. Yes. Um, it's a, obviously a starting place for uh, teaching what has to be done in difficult situations. The FBI has many, many difficult situations. Uh, David was uh, the special, uh, he was a member of the CERG team, CERG is the organization uh, that emerged out of uh, the troubles at Waco. In 2007, mm -hmm. he traveled to San Diego with, to meet with religious scholars as part of the Bureau's interest in becoming more well-informed about uh, relatively unknown uh, religious groups. David, it's all yours. Thank you, sir. Thank you for having me. Thank <clears throat> you for your, uh, for your interest. So, so the my assigned topic was FBI's opportunities and limits in enforcing the law and protecting the public. And I, I take opportunities to mean challenges and, and hurdles. So I, I'm going to discuss uh, those those with you. Uh, but first, my, my partner here, who is Hank Shaw, who's actually our SAC out of Boston, I wanted him to introduce himself so, so you would know, know Hank. Uh, so so Hulk, uh, Hank runs our, our Boston office and, and is here. I am at Quantico. You know, from Quantico, we do run our, our basic agents and analyst uh, training, all of our professional development and our leadership uh, training. And that, that would be a thousand or so new agents and analysts a year, but where we also have a, a, an impact on um, law enforcement across the nation and across the globe is since 1935, we've been running the FBI National Academy at Quantico. So the the chiefs and sheriffs out there uh, pick 
their lieutenants or nominate their lieutenant level officers, mid-range leadership officers who are uh, exhibiting a great amount of, of, of leadership potential and they send them back uh, to us at Quantico for a 10-week block. And so we've been doing that since 1935. That was actually the result of a push from some in Congress for the FBI to take on more policing roles in the country. There were widespread allegations of police corruption, police abuse of power, uh, lack of standardization and professionalization of law enforcement across the country, and there was a large push, early 30s, uh, for the FBI to take over many more national policing responsibilities. Director Hoover, allied with many of our major city chiefs, pushed back on that. The compromise we came up with with Congress is to run this National Academy. So since 1935, about the top 1% in law enforcement, uh, we get back there, and that is, an, and we've graduated about 50, well, two sessions ago, we graduated 50,000th graduate of that program. So that's, that's a place where we have the ability to impact law enforcement uh, across across the country wanted to just kind of you know lay out for you and give you a few statistics on some of our challenge and, and, and some of our challenges you know with the FBI is just pure volume um, looking at at the AAR's uh, mission mission statement you know, which is in a world where religion plays so central a role in the social, political, and economic events, as well as in the lives of the communities, there's a critical need for ongoing reflection upon an understanding of religious traditions, issues, questions, and values. And then when I look at our FBI mission to protect the American people and uphold the Constitution and lay under that our top priorities, it, 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 you know, the, the hill gets pretty steep. So uh, our, our number one priority is, is still terrorism and all of the categories uh, that, that comes with that. Foreign intelligence operations and espionage, cyber-based attacks and crimes, public corruption, civil rights, transnational and national organized crime, white collar crime, violent crimes and subcategories under under many of those um, and you can see where religion kind of intersects with all of those uh, to uh, to some extent we have over 200 violations in those in those categories civil rights alone uh, we have our freedom of access to clinic program Human trafficking programs, several subprograms under that, color of law, which is you know, police mis misuse of power, and hate crimes. I'm going to come back to hate crimes because I think there's some some data there that might be of of interest to you. The bureau is comprised of 35,000 employees, so we represent every race, ethnicity, religion, gender identity, sexual orientation most disabilities uh, that, that you can name. So we are a large organization in all 50 states, 130 countries overseas with a, uh, with a huge, huge mission. That is, one of our, that is one of our challenges, is the number of things we have to have expertise in, and we have to have the ability to reach out to other people that we have developed some level of, of trust and understanding with uh, when, when we need a, assistance wrapping our heads around a problem. Hate crimes alone, um, and that's described as a crime against a person or property in whole or in part by the offender's bias. We have 7,000 victims of hate crime a year, individual victims of, of hate crime. Uh, about 4,216 of those incidents racially motivated. 14 to 1500 are motivated by religion bias. 1263, this is 2015, and if I, if I fast forward to 2017, the numbers are, are close. Uh, sexual orientation bias. And next, gender bias and disability bias is just uh, 88 and, and, and 30. Some are multiple bias uh, uh, incidents, 
um, just a handful, you know, and, and from there, you know, I, I, I think, and I haven't dug down into that to identify enough of them, but I, I think that may be, um, you know, Afri African American police officer killed by an 88 year old white supremacist, you know, attacking the Holocaust Museum. You know, so the, the combination of the racial and the and the and the, the religious uh, bias. So, so big big problems uh, that we're trying to get our heads around. Um, with with all members of the community, I understand this may not be the case, but I can tell you, based off of my experience, and I believe my colleagues' experience, um, we have over our 109-year history developed a, 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 a and Director Comey, this is how he would, he would refer to it before he was, he was fired, uh, as, a, as, a, as a reservoir of trust with the American people. Now, and I know there are some segments of the population that trust does not exist with the FBI or maybe not law enforcement in general. But I can tell you throughout what has been a, a 21 year career in the FBI now, uh, and I believe my colleagues will attest that this is the case also, is that when we, when we go to the community and we say you know, we are the FBI, there usually is, uh, the, usually the next thing that we say, they believe us, and usually they want to be part of the solution of addressing whatever injustice we are attempting to identify and address. Now that, that has nothing to do with, with me or Robin or my colleagues here. I, I believe that has to do with, with 109 years of people who have chosen to do good for a living, who, who see injustice and attempt to address it, who make a promise and work very hard to keep it, who make a mistake and attempt to correct it. A success, I believe, with, with this relationship we have with AAR is that we were, we were at a place uh, with, with the FBI uh, where an incident could have drained that reservoir. Um, and and we, we had the ability provided to us by some insight and some, some hard work and some, some close partners here to, to develop a mechanism uh, where we could reach out of our comfort zone and, and, and engage with people who also, in, in my opinion, you know, choose to believe that every human being has value and that they deserve justice and that, that separate agendas do not have to be mutually exclusive, they can be complementary and who would come to table, the table with us understanding that there are fair, very few rooms, and I think people often don't take the time to, to step back and appreciate when they are in a room with other people who have chosen to live their life, not, not as to you know, what will be the next pay raise, the next nicest car, the bigger house, the next degree, the next accolade, but who have chose to live a life to where when they turn around and they look backwards, at the end of that career or that life is did I live a life with a purpose? Did I do work with moral content? I believe what, what you know, folks here who I have a great amount of respect for were able to put together and I have benefited from it is, is a relationship here to where we do feel comfortable uh, coming to you uh, when we are vulnerable uh, with the lack of knowledge we may have in an area and ask simple simple questions. Um, I do think that much of the conversation that began in the mid-90s was overwhelmed by 9-11 and, and, and now that, that conversation is information, is, is that conversation is about terrorism and Islam and that, and, and that is so loud and there are other there, there's so much that's still under there that I think we may be missing out on. And it's something boiling up there that, that might, 
be a problem for us, a discussion uh, that, 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 we're not, that, that, that we're not having. You know, so for me, the value of this relationship has been over the years is not, not necessarily has, has someone in this, this room or someone through AAR provided me the nugget that's allow, going to allow me to, to win, win a debate when I go out and, and visit with my Islamic center in Little Rock, Arkansas, or give me the little piece of information that's going to help me you know, flip an informant or, or convince someone to come over to my, my idea of, of what a patriotic, hardworking American is. Yeah, is is it, it has it has for me been uh, much more personal in that uh, an understanding, helping with an understanding of my my offender behavior, my target's behavior, my suspect's behavior. You know, there's there's something about religion that's wrapped up, whether it's how how it was how they were raised in it, their beliefs. Their, their traditions that's wrapped up in offender behavior. There's, there's something that's wrapped up in victimology behavior. There's something that's wrapped up in how that victim interacts with his or her offender and how they interact with, with the environment. Being able to have discussions with, with colleagues about what, what does it mean to be the ordained pagan minister with, a, with the Church of Light. When, I'm, when I grew up as a Methodist and have no idea what that means. What does it mean if a victim tells me that she's, you know, she's, from, she's uh, from the coven of the, of the Blue Dolphin? What does this tarot card mean that we find at a, at a crime scene? Uh, you know, being able to have those discussions and inform uh, an investigation uh, or help uh, a, a victim or end a crime spree has been very important to me personally. As I've moved up through the leadership ranks, being able to have discussions uh, with confidential discussions with colleagues before I go and engage uh, with, with members of my community, that's been very helpful as somebody who is representing the FBI and is a member of that uh, community. And as I've moved into the executive management, you know, I have a workforce of 35,000 people and I'm, I'm charged with their professional development and their leadership training and bringing them into the organization and shepherding them through the organization. I want to be as inclusive and as accommodating as I can be to all of that diversity that I have among those 35,000 people. So how, how, how do I do that best? And, 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 and then also, as I have training, is what can I do uh, to make our law enforcement leaders and my new agents and my new analysts uh, more aware, more inclusive, more accommodating, uh, more respectful, better at their jobs. Um, and so AER, I, I think we, we are at a place to where as we move forward and we've continued this dialogue uh, and, and we've had good friends when we've started to back off, they've pulled us in and, and not let go of us. Um, as uh, is. We're, we're at a point where we not only have those conversations now, but we're moving forward. You know, so at, at that National Academy, where I touch a thousand communities a, a year, I get a thousand leaders a year from communities all over this country. At our last session, AAR provided a, uh, a, a presenter to talk about law enforcement's interaction with the religious community. So if we move in that direction, uh, then I think we go, go beyond what, where we started with how do we address a critical incident when it happens, but then how do we have a better understanding of our communities? Because that critical incident starts ultimately with an interaction between two human beings. Two minutes and I'll yield it. I'll yield those two minutes uh, and I'll be here for questions. Thank you. Uh, Eugene Gallagher is a professor of religious studies emeritus at Connecticut College. Uh, he's written about Waco uh, and terrorism and has, partic has participated in a number of AAR arranged meetings with FBI officials. Eugene, the floor is yours. Eugene, can you speak right into the microphone? Mm -hmm. Thank you. So I'm uh, charged with talking about the 
challenges and opportunities of religion scholars uh, working with FBI agents, and I'm glad to be sitting next to the right guy uh, at this point. I want to start with a small story of what was, for me, a critical incident. And uh, several people in the room were there, and you'll remember this story, and I hope I got it at least partially right. In the year 2000, the AAR met at the uh, wonderfully titled and bizarre Opryland Hotel in Nashville. <laughs> and there was a, a signal session there that was hosted by the FBI where they ran a simulated hostage um, negotiation for us. They paused um, the ongoing event uh, several times for the invited um, scholars to ask questions. And I remember one incident, I hope I remember it right. Somebody chimed in and said, how about if you do this? Kind of eager scholar. And the chief negotiator said, yeah, we tried that. People died. <laughs> so I think the response was intentionally jarring. And it highlighted precisely what's at stake in that kind of negotiation as compared to what's at stake when we enter the classroom. I've rarely seen a teacher after a session that didn't go well saying, yeah, I tried that, people died. <laughs> so we have different realms in which we work. We have different kinds of responsibilities. But over time, it's become clear that the FBI and its agents have become involved in multiple incidents in which religion appears to be a salient factor. Professor Weitzman, in his uh, final chapter of the edited volume, uh, addresses how scholars have tried sometimes to fill this expertise vacuum for the FBI, sometimes on a freelance basis, which I'll get to. And uh, Professor Weitzman focuses on the differences between intervening and informing, and re-examines the roles of Philip Arnold and James Tabor in the Waco incident. They got drawn in as actors when David Koresh heard uh, their comments on his theology on a radio program. And they became important enough that in the final letter to his attorney, Dick DeGuerin, Koresh said he'd be happy to come out as soon as he got a copy of his manuscript that he was working on to Tabor and Arnold so that they could uh, then understand it. They wanted to situate themselves as translators of Koresh's biblical apocalyptic theology. They believed they had sufficient knowledge of both the Bible and Koresh's position at Adventism to identify ways of interacting with him on its own terms. Their hope was that they could identify ways that the FBI negotiators could persuade Koresh to leave the Mount Carmel Center by appealing to his self-understanding, sense of mission, and desire for an audience, all of which revolved around his understanding of the biblical book of Revelation. Professor Weitzman has raised some important questions about that type of worldview translation that they undertook. <laughs> While I think we need to devote careful attention to those questions, it's hard for me to see how scholars of religion can avoid adopting the role of worldview translator. Some sort of translation is at the heart of what we do as scholars and as teachers. Since the people we study are so often different from us in many ways, we aim to make them intelligible through various processes of translation. We do not simply repeat what they have said or done, but we aim to translate it by employing descriptive, analytical, and interpretive categories from the academic study of religion. Translation is undertaken then in the service of understanding, but understanding, even empathetic understanding, does not necessarily entail endorsement or support. Advocating for the usefulness of the study of religion is also tightly interwoven into our work. Especially if you teach undergraduates, you often have a seat at the table precisely because a curriculum through general education or other requirements moves students in the direction of the study of religion, if not actually requiring it. So our courses are there for a reason, even when the reason is not well articulated, as is so often the case. 
So for me, the question is not whether we should function as worldview translators, but how. And in the specific case of potential interactions with the FBI, when? Scholars don't necessarily have the training or the skills to intervene directly in volatile situations involving religion, such as Hosky rescues or standoffs with barricaded groups. Freelance scholarly intervention can operate at cross purposes with those of law enforcement. Nonetheless, when the FBI recognizes that religion might be a salient aspect of a situation, it may well be appropriate to make specific requests of scholars of religion. But the FBI needs first to be able to recognize that religion is in fact a salient aspect of a particular situation or incident. That means the FBI needs to cultivate a type of religious literacy. That's for you, Diane. <laughs> that enables agents, one, to recognize when religion's an important aspect of a situation or incident, two, assess how religious commitments are shaping the statements and actions of individuals with whom they come into contact, three, recognize when their own knowledge has reached its limits, and four, access quickly and efficiently reliable resources that can help them. For me, those requirements then have implications for how agents are trained through their time in service. Scholars of religion, put bluntly, can help the FBI integrate religious literacy into the training of agents. That aspect of training ideally would happen before agents encounter situations or incidents in which religion is a factor or when the stuff hits the fan. I'm convinced that the best opportunity for scholars of religion to contribute, however modestly, to the work of the FBI is in the training and continuing education of agents and analysts, not in intervening during potentially volatile incidents. Another possibility for their contributions would be in the analysis of incidents after they happen as the contributions of religion scholars to the anatomy of the Waco incident shows. That would have to go without assigning blame, but in joining together to really analyze what happened and why it happened. So contributing to the ongoing religious literacy of FBI agents would call on elements of our roles as both scholars and teachers. Scholars excel at identifying, retrieving, accumulating, assimilating, evaluating, synthesizing, analyzing, and interpreting data. But that's often a slow-moving process. There's virtually no room in rapidly unfolding critical incidents for that type of patient's work. There are also ingrained scholarly practices and attitudes that can impede communication between scholars and agents. Scholars are frequently given to remarking on how complicated a situation is and how they need more data and more time to unpack things. They're used to communicating with audiences of peers and focusing on nuances of interpretation that incrementally shift paradigms of understanding. Teachers, on the other hand, actually the same people a lot of the time, especially, they draw on different skills. Especially those who teach undergraduates in the US are perpetually involved in introducing the study of religion to students who are statistically unlikely ever to take another course. They have one shot at raising the level of their students' religious literacy. Accordingly, they develop skills of synthesizing and generalizing responsibly as they conduct the intellectual triage process of deciding what to do with students who they will have only once, only for a period a little longer than a calendar day. At the introductory level, it's essential to be able to communicate complex ideas in simple language for a general audience. So as a potential audience for scholars of religion, I'd locate the FBI somewhere between 18-year-olds in introductory courses and our scholarly peers. We'll let you guys figure that out. Okay. In my very limited experience, I found agents to be very well educated, but to have fragmentary religious literacy, often based primarily, if not wholly, on their personal experience with a religious tradition. 
In interacting with agents of the FBI, scholars of religion therefore need to draw on their work as both scholars and teachers. They can employ their research skills to produce information and analysis that, that is insightful, comprehensive, and reliable. They can use their skills as teachers to communicate information and analysis that is trustworthy, succinct, and accessible. By developing broad-ranging religious literacy, agents of the FBI can expand their abilities to define and respond appropriately and effectively to various individuals, groups, situations, and incidents. In some of those incidents, religion can play an important role. The need for religious literacy would be most pressing in volatile situation. If agents or others miss the role that religion is playing, they may constrain their abilities to reach a satisfactory outcome. So I think that this is an appropriate use of what scholars of religion know and can do to contribute to the work of the FBI. And one of the most important things might be the ability to discern when religion is a salient, peripheral, or absent factor in the matter at hand. So scholars would do well neither to oversell nor to undersell the potential usefulness of increased religious literacy. Don't even get to my two minutes. Michael Markoon is a professor of political science at Syracuse University. Um, he has written about the post-Homeland Security 9-11 world and uh, racism. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. In late uh, 2013, Steve Weitzman asked me to contribute a chapter on the Muslim community after 9-11 for the book he and Sylvester Johnson were compiling on religion and the FBI. I thought, well, it's about recent events. That shouldn't be too hard. How wrong I was. It turned out to be excruciatingly difficult partly because important information wasn't yet in the public domain, and partly because the nature of the subject turned out to be far more complex than I ever imagined. So let me share with you some of what I learned. But before I say anything about the relationship between the FBI and the Muslim community after September 11th, you first need to understand a few background factors. One is the nature of the Muslim community when 9-11 took place. Now, the demographics of the Muslim community is a contested area, but the best current estimates place its size at between two and three million. It was largely an immigrant community. At the time of the September 11th attacks, Approximately two-thirds were foreign-born, principally from the Middle East, North Africa, and South Asia. About another 30% were African Americans, either born into the faith or converts to it. As a result, on September 11th, American Muslims constituted a vulnerable religious community, only partially acculturated, that had yet to find its footing in the political and legal systems. It resembled, in other words, the situation of Catholics and Jews in the mid and late 1800s. The second background factor to bear in mind is the FBI's rules for the conduct of investigations. Now known as the Attorney General's rules, they are the offspring of rules first announced by Edward Levy in 1976 as a response to the abuses uncovered in the Watergate era. His successors modified, loosened, and added to them, and we could devote an entire session to them. Indeed, as the rules became increasingly complicated, Doubts were raised about whether agents even fully understood them. An Inspector General's study in 2005 suggested many did not. 
Be that as it may, one change was well understood and immensely important to relations with the Muslim community. That happened at the end of May 2002, barely nine months after the attacks, when Attorney General John Ashcroft issued a statement that significantly altered the Bureau's mission. Traditionally, the FBI, in a broad sense, had the primary task of investigating possible criminal activity that might fall within federal jurisdiction, apprehending perpetrators, and collecting evidence so that they could be prosecuted. But Attorney General Ashcroft now said that they were also to do something else. He declared that from now on, and I'm quoting, the prevention of terrorist acts became the central goal of the law enforcement and national security mission of the FBI, unquote. I vividly remember being at a conference Greg Sathoff organized shortly after the Ashcroft statement, and Greg, I'm sure that you'll remember this incident, uh, and uh, the smile on your face suggests that you do, where an FBI agent said, with great emotion, we don't do prevention. But obviously, now the Bureau had to do it. The outcome, as far as the Muslim community was concerned, came in two forms. Unfortunately, the two forms worked at cross purposes. One we might term community relations. That involved forming close and friendly relations with Muslim groups in the hope that such liaisons would stimulate the flow of information so that intelligence about potentially dangerous individuals and activities would move freely from the Muslim community to the FBI. The other activity was the use of traditional investigative techniques, especially surveillance. This had begun well before the Ashcroft pronouncement, but became even more vigorous afterwards. It took a number of forms, the external monitoring of mosques, for example, or listening to sermons. The problematic forms, however, were those that were genuinely intrusive. We do not have systematic knowledge of them, but there is enough anecdotal information to suggest techniques and likely scope. The best known case, partly because of journalistic coverage and partly because of litigation, occurred in Orange County, California in 2006 and 2007. This was part of something called Operation Flex, whose full range is not clear for reasons I'll get to presently. The Bureau hired an individual named Craig Monte, who was in fact a convicted forger and con man, although it's quite possible the Bureau was unaware of his checkered past when he was hired. In any event, Monte presented himself at the Islamic Center in Irvine, California as a potential Islamic convert. During his time there, at the request of his handlers, he allegedly recorded conversations and planted listening devices at both the Islamic Center and at other nearby Islamic sites. After ingratiating himself with those who attended the mosque, he broadened his activities and began to talk about the duty of Muslims to use violence and about his access to weapons. At that point, the leaders of the mosque became sufficiently upset by his conduct to secure a restraining order against him and, somewhat ironically, to notify the FBI, which ended Monti's undercover career. 
In 2011, after his undercover life became known, individuals associated with the mosque sued the Bureau and a number of individual FBI personnel in Fazaga et al. versus the Federal Bureau of Investigation, alleging violations of the First, Fourth, and Fifth Amendments. However, Attorney General Eric Holder invoked the state secrets doctrine, barring evidence about Operation Flex on the grounds that revealing details of the operation would damage national security. As a result, the Bureau was dropped from the case, but the suit against individuals was allowed to proceed. The remnants of the now truncated suit were argued before the Ninth U.S. Circuit's Court of Appeals in late 2015, but I have not been able to find evidence of a decision in the case. If anyone here has any later information, I would very much like to hear it. What happened in Orange County, together with similar incidents that I have not mentioned, became well known in the Islamic community and served to poison the relationship with the Bureau. It certainly weakened much of the goodwill that had been generated by community relations activities. I have no idea what, if any, information was gleaned from Operation Flex and similar instances of intrusive surveillance nor how its quantity or quality would compare with information that was offered voluntarily. As one looks back over the immediate post 9-11 period, the overall impression is less one of malevolence than of sheer awkwardness, the result of a number of factors. A minority religion poorly positioned to defend itself, a law enforcement agency under great pressure to prevent any future terrorist attack, an agency furthermore at the same time one that had to deal with a religious group about which it knew almost nothing, and an agency that existed in a bureaucratic environment in which it was competing with others for a tiny pool of experts. It is scarcely surprising that recourse would have been had to traditional investigative techniques in the absence of individuals with the expertise to make more sophisticated judgments, many of whom had already been snapped up by academia, the military, or intelligence agencies. Thank you. Eileen Barker is Emeritus Professor of Sociology from the London School of Economics. Uh, Eileen? Thank you. Um, I started studying alternative religions in the early 70s, and um, in particular the Unification Church at a time when it was thought that the only reason anyone would join a cult as they were known uh, would be because they were brainwashed. And I started to get more interested in societal reactions to the new religions. Um, I got to know a lot of the parents, uh, not only of the Unification Church, but other new religious movements. And I got to know a lot of the other actors who were influenced or were trying to influence the new religions. And after some time, it occurred to me that there was a lot of work that was being done by scholars of religion, which was just gathering dust in old libraries. Sociologists don't write very excitingly. And uh, the media, on the other hand, had far better stories to tell. And there was what was called the anti-cult movement developing. And they also had far more interesting and exciting stories to tell than the scholars. And it occurred to me that it would be helpful and perhaps prevent some of the unfortunate things that were happening, in particular the deprogramming, which was the illegal kidnapping of people from their groups, which sometimes had disastrous results at the individual level and also at the societal level. 
Uh, Waco hadn't occurred at that time, but there were things that were going on in Europe and elsewhere that showed that governments and law enforcement agencies really didn't know all that they might know and were making quite a few avoidable mistakes. So I set up something that we called INFORM, Information Network, Focus on Religious Movements, with the support of the British government and mainstream churches, with the idea that we would try to provide information. We um, have never had any aspirations to advise anyone with what to do. In fact, we, it's part of our policy not to advise, even when we're asked to advise. But we do try to give information that's as accurate and unbiased as possible, not only about particular facts, but also about processes. Uh, social life is a verb, not a, not a noun, and there's change going on all the time. And to try and contextualize the knowledge, put it within some sort of cultural and structural framework, and try to warn people, perhaps, of some of the consequences that might occur either because of the behavior of the religions or because of those who were um, concerned with interfering with the lives of the religions for good or bad purposes. Um, at INFORM, we draw from all possible kinds of resources uh, from the religions themselves and from their opponents and from the media and, of course, from scholars. We have an international network of professional experts, uh, that scholars, lawyers, counselors, anyone who knows anything about the movements, but also of people who've got personal experiences of the movements, the members themselves, former members, relatives of members, and their experiences we find very important. We have, and it varies from time to time according to funding, about five staff, all of which have always got at least a master's degree and um, very often a PhD in sociology of religion or religious studies and the methodology of the social sciences. Um, we have a large database on which we have some information on over 5,000 different religious organizations. There are over a thousand religions that have emerged since the Second World War which are currently active in the UK. And we can't generalize about them. They're all completely different. I used to say to my students, if you can come up with one characteristic that they all share, apart from being called a cult or a sect, I'll give you a large box of Smarties. And I never had to give away those Smarties. However, of course, as sociologists or religious studies people, we do generalize and we can see certain characteristics, bundles of characteristics, and processes that are more or less likely to occur. Originally, our inquiries were from concerned relatives mainly, um, but also from the media and various other places. Uh, now it's far more government bodies, law, enforcement agencies, and um, we try both to reassure and alert all those inquiries, inquirers. Law enforcement, we've had from the beginning questions, um, both from local police, um, national, we work with Metropolitan Police, New Scotland Yard, Special Branch, MI5, MI6, GH, um, um, the, the, communications headquarters. And also, we've um, worked, as you've heard, with the FBI and CIA and various other international organizations. Our work became quite important in the eyes of the police as the millennium, the year 2000, emerged. And we got involved with um, quite a number of um, the investigations that they were carrying out. For example, there was a group called Concerned Christians that were chucked out of Israel, and um, they gave us quite a lot of material and even arranged for me to interview the leader, whose name I can't remember now. Um, nothing much happened, of course, in 2000, 
But as the end time reapproached in 2012, we again did a lot of work. Um, a 54 page report for the police on millenarian groups. Um, the police were particularly worried about potential suicides. Actually, nothing happened again, but it did increase our exchanges with the police. And we always had a special liaison officer. This helps with the translation. Um, the police tend to go to this liaison officer if they know about him or her. Um, they don't always. And they come to us, or if we have some sort of concern, we go to them and ask them to get in touch with the people who would be most appropriate. Um, this makes it a lot easier because we, we can speak to each other. We've learned each other's language. Um, at the moment, uh, we, because of turnovers and retirements, these, these keep changing. And one of the jobs I've got to do when I get back is try and set up someone else. The sorts of cases that we have dealt with have been very varied. Uh, an early one was the torso of a young boy that was found in the Thames, who was called Adam. Um, started off with an expert, uh, who, um, soi disant, who said he was an expert and made a bit of a mess of the whole thing. But then the police came to us and we got in touch with the um, anthropologist who works with us quite a lot, who got in touch with other anthropologists and helped to work down the actual village from which the boy had come. Um, also concerned with child abuse, we've, we've done quite a lot of work, both sexual child abuse and physical child abuse. There's something called Project Violet, which was concerned with child, child abuse because of religious beliefs. Um, which happens quite a lot. There's been the satanic scare, which was quite strong at one point and was eventually debunked by somebody who was working first with INFORM and then Ministry of Health. Um, these sort of questions now are far more about extremism. Of course, when you're talking about extremism, it depends extreme from what and what is the norm. Um, there's the extreme right and the extreme left, and uh, the, the real thing that uh, we think is important is if this involves violence, and extremism is obviously a, often, I think, an unhelpful concept. Um, sometimes the violence, quite often the violence is within groups, and we try and explain some of the group dynamics that are involved. Since 9-11, more recently, um, the PREVENT strategy has been introduced in Britain. And this has produced, this, this, this is um, involved asking universities and schools to report uh, potential uh, terrorists. And this has produced quite a negative reaction, which has been counterproductive in a lot of ways. Um, somebody who was in Guantanamo Bay set up an organization called CAGE, which um, the authorities have difficulty with dealing with, but um, we, we can go. I go to the, their meetings and have been to their headquarters, and they're willing to talk to us. And quite often we're used as not mediators, but sort of information gatherers. Uh, we don't go underground or undercover but we, we have got access and trust with quite a few people who um, the authorities feel uncomfortable about talking to. We've dealt with suspicious deaths. Um, sometimes there have been strange pagan symbols on bodies that have been murdered or um, committed suicide. There was a Gurdjieffen case, for example. Shamanism and fraud, various things along that line. We've done risk assessments of a sort when, for example, the NKT, the New Kadampa tradition, was organizing demonstrations against the Dalai Lama. And quite often they'll come to us if there's going to be a demonstration and sort of say, do you think armed police is a good idea? And we might say, well, perhaps it's up to you, of course, but um, they'd they probably be delighted to get that and they're actually rather soft. Or we might say something else. Internationally, um, I've spent a lot of time in Eastern Europe since the fall of the Berlin Wall, 
and um, we have a lot of cooperation with Eastern European countries, particularly in the Baltic. The last 14 years I've been going to China quite a lot, and each year I spend two weeks with the police in China. Um, the police in China are slightly different from the police in Britain, but it's an interesting experience. So just to sum up, um, we try to provide information. We contextualize that as much as possible. We try to stress there are multiple perspectives. No two people ever see the same thing in the same way. There's continual change, but we can suggest certain probabilities. And of course, in Europe, as <coughs> here, there's quite a lot of fake news going on. Greg, Greg Satoff, behavioral scientist at the FBI Critical Incident Response Group, CERG. Uh, he serves as the chief psychiatric, psychiatric consultant for the FBI Behavioral Analysis Units and Crisis Negotiation <coughs> Unit. And for two decades, he has served as the FBI's liaison to scholars of religion. Greg? Thank you, Phil. Uh, one of my roles uh, in life is as a professor in the School of Medicine at the University of Virginia. And in that role, I, I teach medical students. And I, I teach them through working with patients. I'd like to share with you the most memorable patient teaching experience that I've ever had. Almost 25 years ago, I was sitting at a metal table in a 19th century prison around midday, supervising uh, medical students in a psychiatric interview of a violent prisoner. Without warning, the door burst open, and a coughing, smoke-covered prisoner was pushed into the room by correctional officers and anxious nurses. Uh, he was largely incoherent, but I could hear the words fire, and it's the end. After I made sure that he was medically stable, the nurses told me that he was a newly incarcerated inmate who had been watching television in his cell. And when they heard shouting and smelled smoke from the mattress he had set on fire, they uh, were obviously concerned. They asked me to give him medication. I needed to understand first what was going on on that Monday, April 19th of 1993. So this is how I learned about the end of the siege at the Branch Davidian compound. <clears throat> now social media as we know it did not exist at that time, but even live televised images nonetheless produced an acute clinical condition a violent reverberation in response to images on the screen. On many levels, I will not ever forget this emergent consultation, but I think that it's relevant today to emphasize the value and importance of context when government <coughs> consults with outside experts. You know, although consultants are sometimes dropped right into the heart of a crisis, the preparation beforehand and lessons learned afterwards are essential for optimal consultation. During the 21 years that I've served as the FBI's liaison to religion scholars uh, through the American Academy of Religions, I've had the privilege of spending time with both of these disparate cultures and have learned a great deal. So in the time remaining, I'd like to illustrate the value of preparation, response, and learning by way of our experience in three different cities, uh, Jerusalem, Nashville, and Boston. So I think Jerusalem is a fitting place of preparedness and to speak about the issue of preparedness for religion scholars and for government uh, leaders. In 1999, um, religion scholars and uh, law enforcement officials met in Jerusalem to consider and plan for social upheaval in the event that computer technology failed on January 1st of the new millennium. And for those who may not have been alive at that time, uh, this was called Y2K. And much was really at that time unknown as to whether our world's uh, computer infrastructure would transition successfully into the new millennium um, or whether failure would trigger a religious response. So select FBI agents from the behavioral analysis units and crisis negotiation units met with an international group of religion scholars and law enforcement leadership in that summer of 1999. And many of those religion scholars are here in this room today. 
Thankfully, on January 1st, 2000, our infrastructure did not fail us and uh, was therefore not a catalyst for social apocalypse. But the experience of having law enforcement and academic communities meet at the most, at perhaps the most re relevant religious site in the world really helped set the stage for a continuing relationship. So of course, after preparation, thinking about our experience in Jerusalem, which was very positive, comes the whole issue of response. And uh, uh, Gene stole my thunder a bit by talking about Nashville, because I was going to talk about that same tabletop exercise. Uh, and I, so I, I will not go into any detail, but just to note that uh, the perpetrator uh, in that staged event was spouting biblical, um, there were biblical statements, biblical quote, quotations, most from the book of Revelations. And what was interesting was that among top religion scholars in the room, there was some disagreement as to what they might mean in terms of the behavior of the perpetrator. And this is really a critical issue for law enforcement. If you've got a hostage rescue team and tactical people surrounding with with firearms, right, uh, ready to take out the perpetrator if this appears, it, it appears imminent that the perpetrator is going to kill uh, those who are barricaded or hostages. You also have negotiators who are playing for time and seeing if perhaps a negotiation can occur where the individual will put down his weapon and leave, and all will will uh, will live. Uh, the stakes are very high in in that situation. I think the value of that exercise was that the um, religion scholars got a taste of what it's like to be in law enforcement and to have to make these life or death decisions. Also, part of that exercise, for those who remember, is that this was occurring on a busy street in Nashville, Nashville supposedly. And the mayor kept calling in to say, <laughs> you're tying up traffic. I'm having my police and fire departments working overtime. This thing has been going on for three and a half hours. When are you going to end it? So this action imperative, these are the kinds of things that um, law enforcement can be faced with. And it was really um, a, an important experience, I think, to be able to, to share that with some of our most uh, brilliant religion scholars. Um, Michael, as, as you can understand very well, law enforcement when faced with those situations is off, often very humbled by the experience uh, and, and even after a success. And I, I think we all experienced how humbling it is to be faced with a situation where we have one great religion scholar saying, I think it's time to act. I think we need to take out the perpetrator. And another religion scholar says, that quotation means something different to me. Uh, brilliant people can sometimes disagree. The third phase which, uh, in which we learn from our experience is best exemplified by the city of Boston. Uh, but this is not, I'm not talking about this meeting. I'm talking about November of 1999. Now this was only a few months after the important meeting in Jerusalem. And I don't quite know how to bring this up because it's a, it's, it's a bit sensitive. But I think it's important. We had had a great meeting in Jerusalem. And I think there was really a strong sense that we had learned a lot about each other's cultures. And in October, just a few months, just what, three months later, four months later, a report comes out from the FBI called Project Megiddo. And it's all about apocalyptic religious movements and what might happen at the millennium. And it did not access any of the brilliant expertise that we had been cultivating over the years. And understandably, there was uh, some shock and awe, I think, on the part of, uh, and, and other kinds of uh, emotions as well on the part of religion scholars. Uh, and we had to um, inform our religion colleagues that there are many different divisions within the FBI, <laughs> and that we were not aware that this other division was coming out with this report. Had we written the report, we certainly would have accessed our colleagues. But 
What happened in Boston, I think, was really um, important for everyone to know. <clears throat> we made the awkward call to the other division to say, we've got, got some scholars who are concerned about, about what was written uh, and want to know about what you used as your primary sources for, <laughs> for this. And uh, to their credit, the two authors from that division came to the meeting. It was a dinner meeting, I think, uh, hosted at Boston University, if I'm not mistaken. And um, they stood and took questions and comments and other uh, statements and, um, and, and, and addressed those. And, and it, it really was, I think, um, you only know the value of a relationship when you, when you come upon hard times and you have to face a, a problem. And I think that, that this whole issue of after action, how do we really talk to each other in a very candid way to, to decide, determine how can we do things better? And so I came away with that with, with an admiration, certainly for our scholars, for not abandoning us and, and the work that we were doing, but also for those who had written the report and realized that what we had been cultivating in our division was really something that would have been great to access. It's so easy to think that the FBI is some monolith and that there is, we all share the same emails. Um, that's not true. In fact, I, one of the reasons that an investigative body works as well as it does is that it is really quite siloed and, and, and operates on a need to know. But sometimes that can get us into great trouble and that's the case in this. Uh, and this actually brings bring us back full circle to Jerusalem where, of course, I talked about the expected preparation for Y2K. Because I want to say that something else happened at Jerusalem was probably more important. We all went there in order to prepare, prepare for Y2K. Religion scholars met with our senior negotiators and behavioral uh, analysis supervisory special agents. And they also talked about something different, and that was Waco. These were conversations that went for hours. There are people in this room and on this panel who were taking part in those. And I know that religion scholars and FBI personnel uh, told me afterwards that they all came away with a greater, a much greater appreciation of the roles, opportunities, and obligations of others, the other discipline. And so um, this was not only preparation, but it was also a means to, to do an after action and, and realize that there was a, a great amount to learn and that uh, as different communities, we, maybe the chasm wasn't as far, it was possible to, to, to build a bridge, uh, a bridge of knowledge um, and understanding and, and that's valuable. Uh, so whether in a prison cell or a barricaded compound, uh, whether in Boston, Nashville, London, or Jerusalem, or Quantico, it's clear that religion matters and that the AAR and its scholars have served as a model for interaction between government, the academic community, and those we serve. And, and before I close, I just want to say, Phil, it is such an honor to sit at the same table with you on this panel, knowing what you did uh, in the weeks and months after uh, uh, that that tragic day in, in April of 1993. Um, this is an especially historic meeting. Uh, and as I look into the audience, uh, I see so many experts who would just as well be on this panel. I mean, this is really not just an esteemed panel, but an esteemed audience. Um, I just want to recognize a few pioneers of the effort uh, in this room today. And I can say from knowing what the genesis was. It's, it's really those people at the beginning and, and how they create the culture. And it takes a lot of, of courage to do that because there's, a, there's maybe not even a modicum of trust. Uh, there certainly wasn't, was not much in those days. So Rob Montgomery, uh, you, what you did was, was really remarkable, and I, I think few people in the FBI can understand that uh, this unit that you created was not a sure thing. Um, 
but I also want to recognize Massimo intervene. Uh, I sent an email on, on one occasion to many religion scholars, I think five across the world, and asking about a certain specific need, and Massimo responded to me in Italy uh, within uh, 45 minutes, and within an hour we had an expert that he identified in Canada talking to um, our on-scene commander in, in an internationally watched case. So that kind of trust for Massimo to contact another colleague in another country and get them involved in, in such an important uh, matter was, was really meaningful. Rebecca Moore, you have taught me so much uh, about um, new religious movements and the, uh, the, the, the great, great and grave challenges uh, and that Waco is not our first lesson in that. Uh, your work in Jonestown has really been inspiring, and I think about it often, and I've recommended your work uh, often. And, and finally, I want to give special recognition to Kathy Wessinger. Uh, Kathy, from the beginning, <clears throat> you introduced me to some of the finest scholars. It's not only your own work, own important work, but you were so generous in introducing me in that early stage to such giants in the field. And, and really, it's, it's because of that trust that you had and um, that initiative that leads us to the point we are at today. So uh, any applause for, uh, at, at the end of my talk, is really best directed um, to the FBI and religion scholar mentors and pioneers who have meant so much to me in this effort. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> we have a respondent who has the unenviable task of responding to eight people. Nancy Ammerman uh, is professor of sociology of religion at Boston University and has written extensively on Waco and the Branch Davidians. Well, the main thing I wrote about Waco and the Branch Davidians was for you. <laughs> and uh, I am really delighted to have the opportunity for this kind of reunion um, <laughs> today. And my, uh, my role at, uh, at that moment, back in 1993, was in response to the invitation uh, from uh, Mr. Hyman to come and do a post-mortem, quite literally. Um, a post-mortem on an incident that for me as a scholar of religion, but not necessarily a scholar of new religious movements, uh, as I had watched that incident unfold, uh, like many people in this room, I imagine uh, we were sitting there saying, oh, I wish I could tell them and fill in the blank. Uh, and as we watched it unfold and then watched that horrible day when the fire took those lives, there was, we got a really visceral uh, introduction to what's at stake uh, in these kinds of, of situations. Being invited then into the conversation of what did go wrong and what can we learn from it was a very interesting moment in, in my own life and career as a sociologist of religion. Uh, I think it took a lot of courage to bring together the particular people that were brought together for that conversation. Uh, and in some ways, that was the beginning of this kind of collaboration that we see uh, the, the result of uh, today, now uh, 20 plus years later. Uh, there were three religion scholars who were invited into that conversation. Um, Robert Cancro, who was a psychiatrist uh, from NYU, and I have to say as a sociologist in those days when brainwashing was the sort of uh, currency of the day, I was a little worried that there was a psychiatrist who was one of the people who was being called on for expertise, but by golly, he got it. Uh, just from the get-go, he really was a wonderful contributor to our 
evolving understanding of what was going on. And then, of course, Larry Sullivan, who was a member of the Center for World Religions here at, at Harvard, uh, was also uh, part of that effort. And me, a kind of young upstart who wasn't really a scholar of new religious movements, uh, but who could stand on the shoulders of people like Eileen Barker uh, and just uh, draw on the existing research uh, that was there. Now, what, what did we do? Well, the w- first thing we had to do was talk about the very particular thing that happened at Waco and what were the, the things that were particular to that incident that we could learn from. But much more important were the larger uh, recommendations that we made that it's been very gratifying to hear this panel talking about what's happened in the years since and the ways in which those very basic kinds of recommendations have taken on flesh and blood uh, and have had some real successes. Three primary things that we said, I think across each of our reports, that we thought needed to happen. One is that things needed to happen at the basic training level. That is that every law enforcement person, particularly every FBI person, as they're coming into the culture of law enforcement, from the very beginning, somewhere along the line, they need to have, they need to recognize the degree to which religion is likely to come up. Religion is so much a part of everybody's lives that there are going to be situation after situation after situation where they're going to run into some question where an understanding of religion is going to be important for them. And I think there were a couple of really interesting things that uh, listening to people talk about what's happened since. Uh, The kind of religious studies perspective, the religious studies 101 (laughs) uh, course, uh, I think the kind of training and translation ability uh, that people uh, from religious studies have, thank you, that would be great, <laughs> um, is, is really valuable uh, if, in a whole lot of ways. One of the things that we heard from one of the agents uh, who had been at Waco was how hard it was for him to separate his own religious faith and how he as a person of faith responded to the religious Uh, expressions that he was seeing from this religious community, he was repulsed by that as a person of faith. Well, one of the things that religious studies helps us to do is to get just enough distance from our own religious traditions to be able to think about looking at both our own traditions and others with a bit of an arm's length uh, stance that becomes really critical in these kinds of situations. So, Somewhere in that basic training, having that kind of religious studies 101, at least lecture, uh, that begins to introduce to people, religion is important, it's going to take some translation, and you're going to have to be able to disengage from your own religious faith or lack (coughs) thereof uh, in order to be able to to do the work you're going to have to do. The second big a recommendation that we made was that these various law enforcement uh, agencies, not just the FBI, uh, needed some ongoing internal expertise. And there probably didn't make sense to have it just housed in a single agency. It needed to have this kind of broader uh, cross-agency uh, capacity. And it sounds to me like this uh, SERG Uh, has begun to fill that role uh, for our law enforcement folks. And and that's really uh, gratifying to me that that these uh, departments and divisions are are developing their own internal expertise uh, that is better than just the basic training stuff and will give them greater capacity to respond. But the other thing, of course, that we're talking about here today and that people have uh, reflected on is the need for an ongoing network of larger connections and the kinds of bridge building 
that has taken place over the last 20 plus years, again, I find really very gratifying. The fact that both the AAR had uh, the, the capacity and the willingness and the courage to say, yeah, we're going to work with those FBI people. And, and don't, those of you who are uh, academics in the room, you know that's not to, the courage that that takes should not be underestimated uh, because the trust is not a given. Uh, and then again, the courage of the folks in the law enforcement community to be willing to listen to a bunch of scholars uh, and to work with the difficulty of those different interpretations that will emerge in those conversations. So the slow, careful gathering of that network of experts, I think, is something that is uh, to be celebrated here. Uh, and the other piece of the kind of um, capacity building that needed to happen, of course, was the sort of data bank that Eileen has been uh, working on with Inform uh, to simply have a place to go uh, to find out something about the thousands of religious groups that are out there. And no, as you point out, they're not all alike. Uh, so we can't, as religion scholars or as social scientists, simply say, well, here's the rule of thumb about uh, this way of inter uh, interacting with a religious group. We need specific knowledge as well as that more general uh, knowledge about what religion is and how it works in people's lives. So I'm not going to go down the line and sort of respond to each, uh, all the things that, uh, that people have said this, this afternoon. I wanted to really reflect on that larger picture of what I've seen about what these presentations tell us about what's happened since 1993. But I think, uh, as we uh, can tell from uh, especially Professor Barkin's uh, presentation and a number of the remarks here, the events post 9-11 have challenged us all over again. You know, are we in effect kind of reliving uh, some of the lack of uh, information, the lack of training and so forth around the terrorism threat and the, what that means for us, what new kinds of capacities, uh, new kinds of networks, new kinds of data do we need to have to be able to respond to this new kind of, of situation we find ourselves in. And I want to make one last point about that this kind of effort of linking people who are in public service doing the work of implementing, trying to bring about the greater good in our larger communities, and those of us who mostly study what that's supposed to look like. One of the projects I've been involved in uh, in the last couple of years is called the International Panel on Social Progress. And it's in intended to be a kind of equivalent to the International Panel on, on Climate Change, bringing together social scientists who are experts in uh, looking at a whole variety of the kinds of challenges that we face around the world today in terms of governance, in terms of health and well-being, uh, and so forth. Uh, they did sort of figure out that they might actually need to have a chapter on religion. And Grace Davy and I have been you know, coordinating the effort of bringing together scholars uh, to be in the conversation about what do people who want to engage in public policy that is aimed at bringing about social progress, what do they need to know about religion, and how can we help them get to know that? Well, in some ways, our recommendations look just like this. People who are in public health, people who are in uh, governance, people at the Kennedy School, they need a religion 101 in their basic training. They need religious literacy in their basic training. So these issues that we're talking about this afternoon are incredibly important to the kind of life and death issues that people in law enforcement are dealing with. But they're also relevant in terms of the bridging, the data building, the network building, 
all of that is also important for the larger picture of the ways in which scholars of religion need to be engaged with people who are the public policy folks uh, in the rest of our world. from the audience. Back in, in the center. Um, yes, um, I'm not, neither a scholar nor an FBI agent. Um, I'm a journalist. I'm working on a story and I wanted to ask um, the panelists to, in a sense, spin forward a moment. Knowing what you know, experiencing what you have, how does this help you in situations that we're facing right now, such as the white nationalist movement, which has a very strong religious undertone in parts of it, um, and their sort of wildly secular Antifa counterparts? Is any of this knowledge and communication and coordination impacting how you face those challenges? I mean, you know, it just yeah. You know, so, so I think not specific to to this challenge, but across a number of challenges. I think we've built a mechanism uh, where you know we we can readily and 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 Dr. Sadoff gave you one example there of in, in a very high profile uh, case where we were trying to stop the loss of life uh, to where we had this mechanism in place where we could get a specific piece of information that that we needed in a confidential manner. Uh, very, very timely. So, so as, you know, as, as where we're going is I think, uh, you know, we now have something in place uh, that we didn't have in place before. And, and part of that is uh, maybe holding us accountable is that we don't have an excuse not to ask uh, for advice and assistance in areas because we have built this mechanism uh, that is, is responsive to us. Is there, David, is there, is there, is there a how comp do, do you have something that is roughly comparable to your relationship with uh, religions and religious groups that applies to uh, Islamics and how they would react to uh, <clears throat> different ways of trying to reduce harm? Are you specific to, the, to Islam? Yeah. Um. I don't know, Hank. I'm going to. Hank just left me. I was going to phone a friend. So, so I, you know, since 9/11, and one of the issues I think we have with creating the 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 101 course is you know, we, we're in, we're engaged. We're engaged with scholars. We're engaged with with uh, historians. Uh, we're in, we're engaged with with our our Five Eyes partners. You know, so we're engaged in research projects. We have close close partnerships in, in here and in other places. The problem with building the, the 101 course is, can you all agree with me on what should go into that 101 course? Yeah. Other than a basic awareness of, hey, before you go into a situation, you know, then you should do as much studying as you can and know as much about uh, those people and their religion and where their beliefs or their practices, uh, you know, what role that might play in the actions that they're engaged in right now. And, and a, a challenge we will continue to have uh, that, that I believe has escalated since 1993 is the time on the flash to bang in many of these situations, uh, the, the how, how, how this trajectory toward violence, how, how that, that the timeline has condensed in situations is you know, we, we often, you know, there, there is a time imperative of, of you know, is, is we, we, we can't discuss this ad nauseum. We, we need to, you know, out of, out of what are three really bad possible answers, we need to pick the least worst. And, and that's, that's a challenge I think we, we, we have, I think we will continue to have, and I think we will be confronted with as, as, as ISIS is being squeezed and strangled and and you know what's left that comes comes out in between the fingers starts coming back home and then what that what that brings into our our communities uh it, it's it's a 
it's going to cause it's going to bring challenges uh, to us for I, I believe for for years to come. I, I would say also <clears throat> one of the things that we've gained from this relationship with the AAR is, is an appreciation for history to find out that there's very little that's truly new under the sun. Uh, someone like Michael Barkin, for example, who has done so much work and has an understanding about the historical nature of these kinds of events can teach us so much about, about prior lessons. Now we're living in an age where social media has, has changed the calculus in terms of understanding and, and the, uh, um, the nature perhaps of, of, of how we better understand. Those are the kinds of things that are, are new, I think, in terms of communications. But we, uh, we make a very big mistake if we don't realize that there's tremendous wealth of knowledge in prior cases, prior examples, and make sure that we access those and don't, don't lose those. So I think it's a very good and, and, and important question, and it's a privilege that we have some uh, who are sitting on this panel who we are going to continue to lean on with regard to this this uh, advice. Hey, how y'all doing? Hey. Uh, my name is Steve Nunez. I'm a second year MTS studying religion, ethics, and politics here at Harvard Divinity School and hoping to write um, a dissertation in the future regarding uh, the degree to which the discourse of the quote-unquote Islamic problem today compounds the discourse of the quote-unquote Negro problem in the late 18th to 19th or late 19th and early 20th century. So, Steve, I'm glad that you asked the question: What is the role of race in this discussion? Because I believe it's integral. And as I look at this panel, I think that we can see there is a disconnect between white people and black people in the United States of America, especially when it comes to policing and what I would characterize as crime prevention rather than law enforcement. Um, I think a lot of this, um, to me, is, is seated in language, um, especially microaggressive language, like, for example, the joke about your car's going to be towed was very, very discomforting to me because this is a reality. If I'm not already on a black identity extremist list, I will be in the future, I'm sure, with the work that I'm doing. Um, so whenever you use language like, um, let me find it, I, I noted some here. Patriotic, hardworking, American, offender, suspect, etc. all of this comes from a very white place in the history of the United States of America. So I think that it's very, very integral to, to the discussion to look at the history of policing in the United States of America and talk about where we go from here because there is an, a gross lack of trust. Um, as a Special Forces veteran, I've been pulled over on a bicycle because I look like a suspect. So yeah, I guess my question is, is where do we go from here and how do we change the language and the conversation that the impetus is a, a problem of minorities rather than a problem of the majority allowing us to be ourselves in a country that's founded upon liberty and justice that black and brown people never seem to get. So. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah, did you offer a response? Oh, no, I yeah, that's why I thought she was offering a response. <laughs> So, so I, I don't know that I, 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 I can in, in a way that would be, um, you know, so, so the joke was a, was a joke about the towing of a car to someone that I made uh, friends with uh, during, during lunch, and I don't think race was, was, was part of that. Uh, I did when I, I mentioned suspect, said suspect, target, offender, any term you might want to use for that. When I when I mentioned hardworking, patriotic American, I see what you what you heard there. But I believe I was saying that in the context of having discussions with people to discuss with me, you know, what my opinion of being a hardworking, patriotic American, how that might not jive with what what their opinion is, or if that you know. So so I, I think I was opening up there with with you know, identifying biases that I might have that some, some discourse might, might help with. And I can tell you my experience, and, and, and there, there is, 
and, 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 and I, I, I can't address you know, the, the justifiable frustrations that are in, in the black community or in other communities where law enforcement over, over the decades or centuries uh, in its position, and, and it often has been in the position of, of defending the status quo when the status quo is not, not fair and not, not correct. But I can tell you there's a narrative that has taken hold right now that in my experience in communities, and, and specifically in black communities, where, where people are trying to build a decent life for their kids and trying to rebuild their communities where there is this, there, there is, there is this divide that's been shoved in there and I'm trying to think of who is benefiting from it because it's not me and it's not members of that community. Shortly after, and, and shortly after uh, Ferguson and then Baltimore is occurring, I'm in Little Rock, Arkansas and about to go in and arrest uh, 70 we've determined armed and dangerous uh, gang members of a drug distribution network in Blytheville, Arkansas. I'm going in with 18 SWAT teams at 5.30 in the morning. I, I'm sure something is going to happen and somebody's gonna get shot. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm going through this. I have 200 Arkansas State Troopers on standby for what I'm sure are gonna be riots when this occurs. Um, we, start, we start doing arrests 5.30 in the morning. And as the SWAT teams uh, are going uh, house to house in, in a exclusively African-American neighborhood, um, some citizens start coming out in the street. And I, from the own, a bias, which I have already you know, identified what I thought was could possibly happen is I think, oh hell, here it comes. These citizens start applauding. My, my SWAT teams can't get from house to house in time because people are trying to stop them and shake their hands. Women are standing in their doorways crying and waving. An African-American woman comes up to my SWAT team from Dallas and says, my daughter was killed last year. Someone was just murdered in my front yard. You've been, I've been praying for you to come, up, come here. You're the answer to my prayers. Please don't leave. Two gentlemen stand in front of one of our subject's vehicles and won't let him drive away until the SWAT team can get there to arrest him because there was this toxic element that had taken over their town and they wanted them out so they could live. The only thing they asked for was that we not go. We held a press conference. The U.S. attorney was there. The media was there. You've never heard that story because that story is not conflict. That story doesn't sell. Someone doesn't gain power from that story. Um, <clears throat> so as you're doing your dissertation, I'll give you my card. I'll be happy to share some other stories with you. On, on the same point, uh, um, uh, my name is Eric Sorensen. I am, uh, up until May of this last year, I was a supervisory intelligence analyst in the FBI's Domestic Terrorism Analysis Unit. And uh, I came into the Bureau, actually I have an MDiv from Harvard, uh, and I have a doctorate from University of Chicago, and came into the FBI in 2003, worked there. But I was interested in, uh, after a few years, in looking at non-Islamic forms of religious extremism. And so that's, that's what took me to the Domestic Terrorism Analysis Unit, and for about, uh, seven or so years I worked white supremacy extremism where, yes, it certainly is a major motivation within that. Um, if there's any heat to be taken for the idea of black identity extremism, I think that that can probably come to large part to me. We met about uh, a year ago it, within the unit and with some of my sister units uh, to talk about uh, addressing the uh, 
uh, increase in uh, black extremist uh, activity that we were seeing. And previous to it being called black identity extremism, we, uh, the extremist movement was called black separatist extremism. And the activity that we were seeing was, seemed to be focused less on the separatist element of it, uh, 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 separatist issues. And I, I guess just to give some sort of context, uh, I do see race as being very central in what's going on in a number of our extremist movements, or focusing on white supremacy and black uh, identity in particular. But I actually kind of see race as being almost color coding for the, a power struggle within the country. And I see that white supremacy, I see the idea of whiteness as being mutable, just as the idea of blackness is mutable as well. And there's potential for inclusion in either of those and expansion of what, that, what either of those uh, uh, identities mean. And uh, so in any case, what, what I, I kind of see white supremacy as being uh, representative of those who are, feel as though they are in a position of power and that position of power has, is being threatened in some way. A sense of privilege <coughs> is being now eroded. And I see black uh, identity as representing the oppressed and people who have been oppressed within society and it's a means of addressing that. Uh, in either of those cases, whether you're white, whether you're black, as far as the FBI is concerned, what's going to be an issue is if you are pursuing it through criminal means. And that's where the idea of the definition of extremism comes into play. And it's that pursuit of your ideology through uh, criminal means, whether it's force or violence in some sort, that is what brings it into play. And uh, actually, for that matter, I, th I think extremism is actually a favorable term to terrorism because the idea of terrorism seems to me to empower the terrorist. It is <coughs> to focus on the intended effect of that activity, whereas extremism focuses the attention on the activity of the person who is committing the criminal act. But in any case, I don't know that that answers any questions, but I think that you did raise the BIE. The race and uh, issue, I think, is uh, integral to what's going on in, in a couple of our extremist movements in particular. Um, actually, that statement raises a lot of questions for me. I was going to uh, reflect back on uh, the Waco case, but if I could ask you briefly, who are these black extremist groups? I mean, we know the white supremacist um, extremist individuals and groups, but I'm, you know, are there really black extremist groups out there? Well, sure, I'll uh, just, uh, I mean, I'll use historical examples, like a, a Black Liberation Army, for example, would be one. Yes, but uh, yeah, we, uh, there are uh, groups that do uh, 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 pursue criminal activities on behalf of uh, their uh, ideological objectives. And uh, yes, so there, there are still, uh, there, there, it is still an active movement. Um, sure. I'm Wendy McDowell. I'm on staff here. I'm the uh, editor of the magazine at Harvard Divinity School. Um, but I wanted to just go a little more, and I think one thing that I heard that was interesting in the, around the hate crime stuff that I've been thinking about a lot is um, I heard a really convincing uh, argument by someone which said that we really should not be calling what's going on with Muslims in America right now Islamophobia. It's so inaccurate. We really should be calling it anti-Muslim racism because at this point, so I think, about, I think about when you have to categorize a hate crime and you're saying that many times there's intersectionality, I forgot the word you used, but, but I think basically what's going on right now is very much like, I don't think you can, I mean, how do you even separate out, you know, what's a hate crime that's based on religion versus one that's based on race when I think very much that those things are conflated and ha half the time the perpetrators against these innocent you know, folks are um, in themselves don't even know don't even know the religion of the person that they're attacking, right? They don't. I mean, they don't know enough to even know the difference between 
a Sikh and a Muslim in some cases, um, and things like that. You know, they and and in fact, and they're way more likely to attack you know a Muslim who is a person of color than they are you know a Muslim who's not a person of color. And so I, I know this statistically. I've done a lot of reading because I've been thinking about it a lot. So that, that's one thing. Then I also wanted to, uh, also on the um, Muslim issue and the targeting of Muslims and the way that Muslims have been, I just recently finally read, it's been on my you know, bed, bedside table forever, uh, how does it feel to be a problem, um, which, I, which I really loved. Um, learned so much from, and there's a lot about surveillance and, and how much has been implicated in, in those communities. And, um, and I, I just think that, um, if you really look at incidents in this country of, of the, in fact, and the biggest ones that have gotten the most press in terms of where there has been domestic terrorism, if you want to put that in quotes deliberately, um, it's almost always second generation uh, Muslims. It's not, it's not, you know, it's not people coming from other countries. And yet it seems like, you know, very much the rhetoric is very much about this, you know, this foreign threat, right? This foreign threat, and even just what just got said about oh, these these you know people are going to come back home from some place or whatever. It's often second generation folks, many of whom aren't aren't that religious, at least in the beginning. You know, they they become radicalized through this. So I just think that I just what I'm interested in, I, I guess, is how the AAR maybe and its partnership, or whatever, is maybe helping to even just re rethink or reset some of these categories and how we even think about these, um, you know. Um, both hate crimes, I guess, on the one hand, and then uh, uh, I don't, I, I don't even like the word terrorism, but how, how we even think about, you know, who, who is getting um, put, put, you know, or how the work is actually even being done in the field. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, so as far as what the AAR is uh, is doing and engaging with us, and I just, I just lost the name. Is Steve Herrick still with us? Steve, the, uh, you, you had the speaker you had come to National Academy. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, you know, just just facilitating bringing someone in to talk to us about, hey, Islam's not the problem, and and even even how the the terms that we use, uh, you know, are are as much of a problem, mm -hmm. uh, and, and so you know that that was the first in that last session was the first time we put someone in front of the National Academy. Uh, it was it was borderline explosive, right? I mean, some of those uh, some of those chiefs and sheriffs, you know, who had been in front of their boards, um, you know, arguing for more resources based off of this or that, you know, are being given a different perspective. So I think I think there was some growth that occurred there. Uh, the hate crime statistics, I don't have a good answer for you on. You know, I, I thought it would I thought you would be interested in seeing those statistics, and I wanted to call out uh, what we specifically had as. You know, listed, motivated by religious bias. You know, right off, yet these are hate crimes that are reported, and not those that aren't reported. I thought it was interesting that that out of in 2016, the 7,615 victims that we had, you know, that that 4,426 of those somehow was being identified as being racial, racial, uh, or ethnicity bias. And then number two there, 1,584 was motivated by religious bias. Is there an intersection? Probably. Uh, what, what I saw from the stats and how they were collected with that, that 106 were victimized with separate multiple bias incidents. I was trying to wrap my head around what we would call a multiple bias incident. And then I thought, okay, a confusion of someone attacking a, a, a Holocaust museum and then killing an African-American officer who was Protestant while making that attack, and he's a, and the attacker is a white supremacist. I thought, okay, that that would be something that would account for one of those statistics to me. Um, and then we also have a breakdown of based on reported biases and and hate crimes against religious groups. So the largest percentage of the reported that I'm seeing there, 55% uh, or so, are hate crimes against uh, Jewish groups. And second, around 20% or so, is Islamic uh, groups of those that are reported. Um, uh, yes. So I come from the discipline of anthropology, which has had very interesting and disturbing uh, relationships with organs of the state, uh, right down from the colonial state uh, to more recently uh, 
the CIA, for example. Uh, and we've had similar conversations across sister disciplines like the American Psychological Association, uh, where the relationships between professional organizations and organs of the state like the CIA or the FBI have been both unearthed as well as exposed for some of the more disturbing trends that that can lead to. And I wonder if the, if the AAR is also putting in place systems uh, that might both question as well as help reflect on the relationship that it is forging with organizations like the FBI. Because it is just very easy uh, for that relationship to become too cozy. Uh, on the other matter of the black identity extremism uh, movements, uh, I can't help but be reminded of the president's uh, take that both sides do it. And I think if we reflect on the, on the profound untruthfulness of that statement, we can probably have a conversation going uh, about what exactly the black, black identity extremist is. I don't think it exists, but I'd be happy to hear more about it. Eileen? I'd just like to come back for a minute on the extremism thing. In Russia, there is a law against extremist religions. Um, the Jehovah's Witnesses have been, to use their phrase, liquidated uh, because they're an extremist religion. The writings of Nursi are considered extremist. The Bhagavad was considered extremist until the Indian parliament objected. Extremism, if you believe something very strongly, I consider I'm an extreme moderate. I think it's very dangerous to use the word extremism because you are assuming a norm that can shift even criminal to say they are criminals. If you're a criminal in North Korea, that's very different from if you're a criminal in America or in a democratic society. I would prefer to use the word violent. If you think that terrorists give status, I, I, I can sympathize with that. But don't think extremism is better because there's an awful lot of things that I suspect you would not approve of being carried out because people are accused of being extremist. It is in relation to something else, if you're talking about extremism. Therefore, it's very mobile. Whereas violence is violence. I mean, it can be violence to the body or violence to the mind or something, but at least you know what you're talking about. With extremism, you can slip in a whole lot of things. And people do. They manipulate concepts like extremism. And it's dangerous, I think. If, if I could just back to so what, what would your your uh, your definition of a of a relationship that's too cozy be? I don't have the facts in front of me to actually give you a definition, but yeah, uh, I don't know what this relationship is uh, founded on, where it's leading, what its aims are, uh, and what the limitations on it are going to be uh, yeah. in terms of an ethics, a professional. I want to thank everyone, including the audience, for these really excellent questions. I just wanted to raise one other point that I think the scholars can help address, which is we use this language violence. I very much appreciate your challenge to extremism, first of all, because it's always relative. Uh, and any uh, person in a position of power, and we see it in state-sanctioned violence all over the world, uh, where we're, all you have to do is call a group an extremist group and then state sanctioned violence is, is authorized. So I want to really appreciate that. But I also want to challenge the notion then that violence is violence because there are different kinds of violence. There's direct violence, which is violent, um, war, maiming, etc. But there's a form of structural violence that needs to be identified, which is the fundamental inequalities that shape societies that then create the conditions where some people who have been marginalized for a long time or uh, in a more contemporary way uh, feel like they have very little recourse to address other challenges. And so then when we talk about violence being violent, 
we don't recognize structural violence as a form of violence. And I think that that's a really critical dimension of what it means to understand the complexities of these dynamics. And then in law enforcement, again, I don't want to minimize in any way the challenges that law enforcement face uh, around these critical questions. But I, I just think a, a nuanced understanding of violence itself is a really important dimension of this conversation. So thank you. I'm still left wondering, uh, most of this meeting has been, been about the quite remarkable way that the FBI and religious scholars have started to work together. And I take it that the purpose of that, a large part of the purpose is because <coughs> we want law enforcement to understand how the world looks from the point of view of the Branch Davidians. And we'd like the branch, we don't, can't, don't have the same capacity to do it, but we'd like the Branch Davidians to see how the world looks from the point of view of people who aren't Branch Davidians. The, let's say the uh, complacent majority in a city. But why aren't we saying the same? So I, I regard that as a triumph. It's really been going very well and it's a remarkable thing for the FBI to have done and for the religious groups to co be cooperating with. I think it's wonderful. But I wonder why we're talking about religion and law enforcement instead of world views and law enforcement. Uh, African Americans in the heart of Boston, or the, particularly the heart of Chicago, have a world view that I don't think the police of Chicago understand. The question is, wouldn't it be better if we could somehow there get across that world view, aren't, aren't we talking about uh, making it more difficult to be violent, more difficult to be cruel, more difficult to be nasty, if you understand the other side's point of view? And I'm wondering, aren't we talking about not religion plus race, plus, uh, and including in religions, uh, uh, the Muslim religion. I mean, I wonder, aren't we talking about would law enforcement benefit and would the country benefit from a determined effort to see how the world view of particular groups that feel that they're in some conflict with the majority, how they see the world? That, Understand what I'm asking? I'm asking why is it that we're not, a religion is a world view, but why, uh, why haven't, it, is it just, it takes time, I'm not surprised we haven't done it, but shouldn't the FBI be teaching, David, uh, what's the world view of uh, black or Hispanic teenagers in Chicago? Yes, you know, and you know, and 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 bringing in that worldview, you know, the best way to do that is by increasing our diversity, for one, uh, so we have members of those communities that are that are, you know, and, and so, so a large a large number of Chicago police officers are African American and are from Chicago, so I think they probably have a good solid understanding of of what their brothers and sisters and cousins and neighbors are confronted with in Chicago. So the idea that there is this complete divide between you know, law enforcement and the community, I don't know, I don't know that I believe that that's, that's correct. We do, and we, we did talk about, you know, discussions of lessons learned, and we do in, in our uh, new agent and analyst curriculum have one day set aside that we spend talking about the FBI in the 60s and the things, the things we did right, you know, the, the, <coughs> the rooting, rooting the Klan out of some of our state police forces and, the, and some, of the, some of the things we did right in the South. And we talk about Dr. King and we talk about uh, wiretaps. But we also discuss how a community, how, how a nation can be in a place, you know, uh, uh, imagine uh, you know, being in a time of great right, racial uh, strife, distrust,
political polarization and thinking that the Russians might be dropping operatives and money in to make that even worse. Hmm. That would never happen, would it? You know, and so, so, so we talk about, you know, what put some context around what was happening when Hoover made those bad decisions, and we show them the document of the other person that signed those wiretaps. And do you know who the other person that signed those wiretaps on Bobby Dr. King Kennedy. was? It was Bobby Kennedy. Two people on absolutely opposite end of the spectrum, political spectrum, because of what was going on in this nation at the time, yeah, signed the same document to do that. You know, so, so we, we do, and then we take the whole group to the Martin Luther King Memorial, and, and, and we have facilitated discussions about his different quotes and what that means to each of them. I, 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 I regret that in a lot of those conversations, I have only a handful out of that, that 200 that I have there African Americans who are there that are, are holding up the that end of the conversation and, and giving giving that uh, that perspective something and a concern I have is so this relationship was built and and I believe some good people you know from the bureau invested in this because in the end you know the the people you know, who had to pick dead burned babies up out of that house and bring them out were law enforcement officers. There is, there is trauma there also. I believe we had good people who, who wanted to invest in a relationship to where the next time we have a Branch Davidian group that none of us know a thing about we are comfortable reaching out to someone who knows more about it than us and saying, can you help us? 9-11 occurs, and then it's terrorism and Islam. And, and that is, I am not saying that that is not an issue that we should all spend all of our time talking about. And there are the concerns we have about how our communities, and specifically our black communities, have been and are being treated. That's a conversation we should all spend a lifetime talking about. My fear as those two things are out there, as they have now been at the forefront of this, that floating underneath us is that, that next branch Davidian out there that we're not able to have a relationship to talk about uh, because we can't come to a, a, an agreement uh, on, on these other issues. And and that, that, that the AAR will pull back or that we will pull back and we won't have that relationship to make that call to ask that question about that, that entity. So I, I'm not saying it shouldn't be part of a large discussion. I just, I think, we, I, I think we need to protect the ability to call you and ask you a question about that group we don't know anything about, that we've never even had a debate about, that we've never read an article about. I'm just glad we have the guy who's in charge of training all FBI agents <laughs> here with us today. David. Anybody else want to change the training in any important way? Kathy's been. I, I've had my hand up for a while, if you don't mind. Um, well, first of all, um, I appreciate getting to know uh, David Resch and what you're trying to do at the FBI Academy. That's really important. You're in a position to try to enhance the religious literacy of agents and police officers, and also literacy on other important issues that we've been discussing here. And I also want to thank uh, Robin Montgomery for what he did with the creation of CERG and, uh, and the way the Freeman standoff was handled. That was absolutely correctly handled. And one of the most important things you did, I think, in Montana was that you allowed um, Gary Nessner and his team of negotiators to implement good negotiation, negotiating practices that FBI agent, FBI negotiators, they know how to negotiate. And Gary Nessner in his autobiography reveals that um, he was not permitted to implement those procedures uh, with the Branch Davidians. Uh, and he was taken off the case on March 24th because he was 
um, he protested the high decibel sounds and the, and the bright lights and things like that. Um, I just want to mention that in 2003, a journalist, a former journalist, um, Lee Hancock with the Dallas Morning News, she gave me a lot of internal FBI documents that somebody in the FBI gave her. And I don't know who. It wasn't me. No. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, it took me a long time to get around to reading them. And, and I'll just say for graduate students here, those, all those documents are in the um, Texas State University archive. I've done some work on them, but there's a lot more work that could be done for anybody looking for a dissertation topic. But so six years ago on my sabbatical, I read through the, um, the lock, the major event lock for that case. And I learned some things and, you know, for instance, when we started this process, uh, religion scholars and the AAR reaching out to uh, FBI agents, we thought, we the scholars thought that um, FBI agents had just consulted the wrong experts and needed to be educated and so forth. But what I learned from looking at these um, these documents in the Hancock collection, especially the um, especially the compiled log, is that the negotiators, the officials in SIOC, in the Hoover Building, Strategic Information Operations Center, it's recorded there in the log that they understood that the Branch Davidians had a theology of martyrdom. And the other, the other documents in the Hancock collection revealed that the FBI was evaluating the Branch Davidians from the beginning for the possibility of a mass suicide. And the conclusion, different people, not just uh, Pete Smerick and Mark Young, there were other uh, reports, and uh, you know Clint Van Zandt and uh, Dr. Joseph Krupchek, uh, a, a psychiatrist, and they based this on, basically, the other thing I learned it, from these documents is that FBI agents were out gathering intelligence. This was just part of the intelligence gathering on the Branch Davidians. What did they believe? What was their worldview? And so they had a theology of martyrdom, and, but the behavioral science analysis was David Koresh is not, probably psychologically not capable of committing suicide, but he could well orchestrate a suicide by cop scenario. So, you know, the question I'm left with, and this was the, the um, I mean, the people in SIOC knew this, the officials in SIOC knew this. And they, nevertheless, they persuaded Janet Reno, oh, by the way, the Reno briefing file is also in the Hancock collection. So I could see where Janet Reno felt manipulated by the higher officials, and she came down to trusting you, and and you know you helped implement uh, a, uh, a new agency or new, um, you know, you know this CERG, the Critical Incident Response Group. You helped implement that to prevent these things in the future, and that's wonderful. But so, in other words, and I think this gets to your question about ethics. You know that when you have religion scholars advising agents, giving them our best advice, we don't know how it's going to be used. And um, will, you, will you use it to bring about a um, peaceful resolution, more or less peaceful resolution, so that innocent people don't get killed? Or, you know, what were the motivations of those officials who did know about the theology of martyrdom? Um, you know, that's, that's the open question. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's all. I have to say, <laughs> but the, 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 the decision makers, you know, not the HRT agent on the ground, not the operator on the ground, but the, the um, special agent in charge, the negotiators, people and officials in SIOC. I don't think the director had a clue, but anyway, but the officials in SIOC, they understood that David Koresh had a theology of martyrdom. So, um, so I hope you know the work that you're doing ongoingly can uh, prevent that from happening again. Mm -hmm. But um, those are the questions that I'm left with about that case. So we spent some time at UVA this last this last week, and and uh, and, and visiting Sir also was uh, Dr. Uh, Thomas Joyner from FSU, and who's done done 
quite a, quite a bit of work on you know mur murder suicide murder suicide motivations you know and with four primary motivations being uh, duty mer mercy justice glory you know and 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 as we were discussing those I was thinking you know you can you can wrap you can wrap religion you can intertwine religion into all four of those motivations in some way also We are coming to the end of the session, but I wanted to see if there were any other comments that anyone on the panel would like to make. Um, or Phil, if you have any final comments you'd like to make before we, before we close and invite people out to a modest reception out there, unless people who have been passing by have gobbled up that <laughs> modest reception, which is entirely possible. Um, but any, any other comments? from any of our panelists. I'll leave mine. We can have conversation over the reception. Okay, yeah. I think conversation would be. Well, and uh, for the whole panel, and I'm sure the audience as well, we, we thank uh, the Divinity School so much for putting this together. It's really been, been meaningful. Thank you so much. And at, at just at the, uh, before you, you uh, so at the risk of anyone thinking that I'm trying to escape uh, I, I am shortly going to leave for the airport, so if someone has a, 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 a concern, an issue, something you want to dig in a little bit more with me, instead of going out to the reception, I'll stay right here before I have to, uh, before I have to go anywhere. Well, I, I would like us all to give a warm round of applause to the panel. These, these conversations are rare and so critical, and these collaborations so difficult to establish and sustain. And I want to just thank all of you for the work that you've done to help us move as far as we've come. And thank you all for coming.